Video game graphics have evolved over the years, from the early inception of pixels and vector graphics in the 70s to a point where they are no longer recognisable. But one thing has remained, and that was the single-handed winning solution, rasterization. This has been the basis for pretty much all methods of real-time computer graphics and formed a large part of offline renderers. Pixar's RenderMan itself was a raster-based application. This method has carried over from the old 8, 16, 32 and beyond bit walls from PC to console. The old 2D method of drawing tile-based backdrops and overlaid sprites is arguably perfect for this line-drawn method, allowing the image to be built up ahead of being shown on screen and then having the raster method scan across the screen and draw each line via the electron beam of our old CRTs. But once we move to 3D rendering, now having a third axis for depth or height added much more complexity to this process, but rasterization was retained with this step forward. Now improvements to it were obviously made, including splitting up the image into chunks or tiles so that each pixel can be calculated and shaded in parallel across the GPU cores. Roughly, this is how a standard frame is drawn using this method. The scene is calculated using vectors and vertex points to allocate the objects within 3D space, including depth, essentially the drawing of the triangles. From here, the resulting image is transformed into a single plane from the chosen camera point. This is what the GTE offered up as a hardware feature on the PS1. Transforming these points into an equal corrective position using a relatively simple linear algebra calculation. This image from the viewport is then calculated in sections to reduce bandwidth and maximize performance. Each triangle is validated from the frustrum view to determine which pixels are affected by it, what color it is, if it's visible or not etc and then the required color is set from here additional work is also run including another viewport for light sources to determine shadows and lighting and any post-process effects such as motion blur depth of field bloom alpha effects ambient occlusion and so on and this draws your entire frame. This happens every single frame, so 33 milliseconds for 30 FPS, 60 milliseconds for 60, and so on and so forth. The core method is far more complicated than this, of course, but as a high-level overview, this is how it works, and it's worked well. Now, what this solution is not so good at is pretty much everything that makes life look like life really, namely light and shadow. You see, the method described is like most rendering methods, an approximation or a hack. Many effects and techniques currently used exist due to the base limitations this method revolves around such as, but not restricted to, light reaction on objects, materials and reflections, shadow and ambient lighting, including global illumination, which is the bouncing of photons and subsequent occlusion, distortion or absorption of them within surface properties and reflectance. Now, these are all problems, big problems, that GPU programmers have and always will be solving with more convincing but efficient solutions, algorithms. Now, what if this problem could be simply removed, though? Well, it can. Sort of. And contrary to the Jensen Jobs presentation, it does not just work. Nothing is ever that simple. But it does solve much of this better. Wonderful reflections and refractions. It just works. This has never happened before. It just works. So what we did is we worked with Nixies. It just works. It just works. It just works. Now, rasterization was not the only method known of when video games started out. Ray tracing was also known at the time, and this carried a great deal of benefits over the other. One single factor, though, that ruled this out for pretty much all methods of animated rendering at the time was computational cost. See, rasterization is fast, but needs much work, see above, to deliver convincing images. Ray tracing is almost exactly the other way around. Now, this is still true today, and the reasons for this are likely more than you may think. Now, unlike raster methods, ray tracing is perfectly suited to handle 3D objects and removes the limitation of flipping and flattening this multi-dimensional world into a single isolated viewport or plane. Now, rather than working out what the viewer can see just within this finite scope, rays are cast per pixel from this viewport into the scene using a recursive algorithm. This means that the ray itself will not simply stop when it hits an intersection or object, but it will continue for a pre-calculated distance or until the equation is resolved to a sufficient level, again, decided by the programmer or artist. 
Now this ray is where the name comes from and it allows a scene to be drawn with as much or as little detail as needed. Each pixel that is traced will go into the scene, determine the first object it hits, and then request the material properties, the albedo, the roughness, etc. And then further rays will be sent out from this point, which are namely three. Reflectance. This is a diffuse surface and it will reflect light in all directions. Therefore, it will have a low level of reflectancy. A high smooth specular surface such as glass or metal will have a high Fresnel calculation which will in turn focus the reflected surface back at the player's eye accurate to the source, normal and any micro facets. In addition to this, the radiosity of this light or the fluorescence from it, the material, will be a factor in that light and what is or is not consumed. Now this forms the key function for global illumination, i.e. the bouncing of that light. Now refraction, this is where the incoming light is adjusted, deformed or redirected back across or through the material. Now think of caustic reflections when you shine light through a glass or underwater. This is the focus of light rays into a higher concentration. It's also why you have distortions on glass objects or water. Now the final one is shadow or occlusion. Once a surface is detected, a new ray is then bounced off towards the nearest or included light sources to be determined if this is in light or in shade. If occluded by another object, then the pixel would be shaded accordingly. Now again, this is a high level overview and does simplify the process, but you can already see the benefits this solution offers. Rather than having to draw a view from each light source in the scene separately just to determine what surfaces are in light or shadow, draw the shadow map and then discard the rest of the information you've just calculated, we now get this all calculated per pixel accurately from within our ray tracing pass. In addition, depending on how many bounces we allow this ray, we can have multiple bounce GI, calculate multiple light sources such as area, point or directional and even refract the light travel behind as part of this one sample route. The other big win here is in reflectance, as this is a huge limitation of the current rasterization method. Now if you cannot see the object or surface within the scene, the viewport, then you simply cannot reflect it without some other method. Now these come down to three main areas that are regularly used in modern game engines and have been used in much older ones. Cube maps. Now these are the pre-computed images taken from a wide angle at fixed points within a scene probes that I've talked about many times before. These are then used to offer reflections for buildings or cars in racing titles of the surrounding scenery. This allows off-screen reflections to work but not, most likely, include any dynamic objects at all. Screen space reflections is the other. These were invented to solve the big issue of cube maps, namely dynamic objects. They are formed from a depth sample using the Z-buffer to redraw the reflected source opposite to the view, i.e. the view and the reflected light lay on either side of the surface normal, and this is calculated by firing rays to get this reflection. Now planar reflections are the final one, and much like the shadow drawing method mentioned earlier, this involves redrawing or re-rendering the scene again from another angle, allowing off-screen objects to be reflected in a mirror say. This is computationally and memory expensive method, as it really requires everything to be done twice. Think of a rear view mirror in racing titles as a base example of this. These are the kind of solutions that ray tracing would resolve but would it be better than this is another question. With all of this broken down, you're probably thinking, duh, why not ray trace games now? Just do it, problem solved. Well, the simple answer is hardware and real-time requirements make this all but impossible. As we mentioned above, rasterization is fast above all other things. Ray tracing is slow above all other things. And on current or even impending GPUs, this is still not a viable option for games really at all. What is possible is a hybrid of these, and this is what we have recently seen from NVIDIA and its new RTX 2070 and 2080 cards. Now, I will cover these in more depth later, but for now, they have allocated and designed a core hardware function of these 
the named RT cores, dedicated to handling ray trace calculations within scenes that shouldn't really affect the rasterization part of the card. Now, based on the evidence shown, and I do need to read much more on this, so bear with me on that, they are likely mixing up ray bundles, a combined set of rays to reduce the cost at the expense of accuracy. I would imagine the shadow of the Tomb Raider is using this for its shadow option. And then the temporal reconstruction and AI to fill in the gaps. The simplest way to describe this is to use Quake 2 running with a full path traced engine, which is what I'll mention later about ground truth. You can see as the camera moves, it breaks down into points. It looks like it's constructed from a dot on the artist's pen. As it moves, the gaps are noticed and the object breaks down. Stand still and it looks much better. Using stochastic algorithms, effectively random sample points, you get a higher accuracy and over time, you can use this jitted method to inject or guess what the missing data would be. This is really how current temporal AA solutions work. The result is almost a point cloud creation of the world. Instead, they are the individual rays hitting the surface from the camera and are then drawn. What we have in these demos is the majority of the scene is still calculated as per rasterization methods. But certain functions such as shadows or reflections, i.e. light, is being generated from ray traces. Now the Battlefield 5 section was a perfect example of the benefits this solution offers within reason. Aside the clear and obvious shiny car and scenario, this was a demo after all, it highlighted just what real reflections can offer on a visual and immersive level. Seeing the off-screen explosions in the car could only be done using this method or a combination of the others I've just mentioned above, which would likely not be as convincing and could even be possibly more expensive. It expands the possibility for a new gameplay and design choices beyond what is currently possible within the constraints. The recent shift to physically approximate shading will help here, as the current methods will work just as well, if not better, with these new ray trace solutions. Taking the BRDFs and any microfacet distortions from the normal means that light will be even more realistic if properly implemented across the variety of material properties. The reflectance here is clearly a fast demo, with obvious signs that this is not fully implemented yet. The specular on the floor loses any sense of shadow or depth because there's no shadows casting, so the cars look like they're floating on a bed of glass with no reflectance or shadow at all. There's no dark contact area. In addition, some of the actual reflections look like they're still using a fallback to screen space reflection. You're getting artifacts around the edge of characters on the foreground and background, and certainly in the Fresnel area where they're reflecting back off the building with a very low quality cube map there, which wouldn't be in a PC version, you can see that it fades in and out with some depth issues on which is being rendered first. You see the roof of the cab and the building just gently fade as the camera moves forward. Another thing to note here is you can see that the tessellation of the object or geometry is increased once RTX is turned on. It could be down to the fact that they're trying to improve the actual curvature of the object, therefore you need more of triangles to give that better balance of reflections, or it's the fact that this will be wrapped up with the higher resolution or high settings on the console. But it could also be the fact they're just trying to make the demo look better. This is very early and I'm pretty sure that this DICE has been asked to do this by NVIDIA with some funding to get out for this PR message. So I'm sure the guys at DICE didn't have that much time to put together what is already an impressive demo of the techniques that can be used. Again, the reflections we saw in Remedy's Control use this well, offering a much better level of specularity within the scene without the obvious drawbacks we get from screen space solutions. Shadows are another benefit with them being able to calculate accurate shadows from multiple sources and adjust them real time within the scene for static and dynamic objects alike. No need for shadow maps here. Now these all fall well within the expectations, as I've said, for this solution. I, I predicted these would be the options we would get. But the same issues still apply here as before. To replace rasterization with ray tracing, or better still, path tracing, you need a much higher level of computation, bandwidth and memory not to mention the dreaded scourge of latency. I will cover it in another video, but current GPUs are all designed around solving rasterization problems from wavefronts to caches, large pools of memory, EQAA. They have all become very good at doing this job. Ray tracing does not share much of this as a method and actually introduces many more issues not highlighted in the mainstream. <laughs> Thank you. 
I mentioned path tracing for one simple reason. This is what a lot of teams use to validate their work, i.e. the ground truth. It's very, very expensive and is above ray tracing. It's a better solution on the Monte Carlo path. So this is what teams use to get that level and then they compare what they've delivered. Is it close to that ground truth? But fundamentally, ray tracing still has many areas still left here to fix. These break down to a few, but not all of them. Some of the main ones are though, anti-aliasing. Having a ray cast into the scene itself lacks the weight that current methods do. If my ray of a pixel from 1457 hits a triangle, how much of it was in the triangle? All of it? 10% of it? 75% of it? If this is not known, then we have a much bigger issue of aliasing, i.e. sub-pixel movement as pixels appear and disappear from existence as we move. The quick answer to this is we need to send out more rays per pixel and increase the sampling just like super sampling. But for a temporally stable image, there is no fixed answer as to how much this should be. How long is a piece of string, essentially? Sure, for bright white areas or yellow or dark brown or black areas, the level of sample can be much, much lower. But for a standard scene with a mixture of color, movement, luminosity, it is likely into the tens to hundreds of thousands per pixel. Therefore, we saw the heavy reliance on the neural network reconstruction methods here to improve the image or the gaps here by injecting this under sample data parts using various other sources. Again, this is just TAA. Memory and geometry increase. A big difference between ray tracing and raster is that you must keep much more of your world geometry in memory and active. Many of the performance gains in raster methods come from culling triangles that are not in view, obscured or off camera. This improves performance, reduces pressure on the GPU and helps add more to the visible scene. Now this is no longer as simple. Before a building that dropped out of the left hand side of the camera would be simply cooled. But with ray tracing we need to leave this in memory and sample it from the rays to draw the reflection of it in a nearby window or a car headlight. The same for alpha effects and character models as the rendering load increases the amount of time left to do other work is all reduced. This small memory and bandwidth is required to fulfill all of this. The last one is recursive or secondary rays, the core aspect of what we're talking about here. The single biggest benefit of this is the secondary, third or etc rays that are calculated into the scene and these are X amount per pixel. This is where the benefit comes from in terms of image accuracy and solution to other problems. The issue here is they are not coherent and as such, you need to find a method to balance out the random nature and reduce your workload, bounding boxes, etc. And it's pretty much what rasterization resolved with things like BSP, binary space partitions. I covered this in my Wolfenstein and Doom videos. You can check out the link below or on screen if you want to check that out as well. With all that said, the question asked at the very start of this video is still to be answered. And that answer is, it depends. In the short to medium term, i.e. the next five to eight years or so, I would say that no, it's still not the most pragmatic and efficient method of rendering for real-time games. The basis of this is that even offline renders for films still use a hybrid of ray, path tracing and rasterization to maximize the cost versus quality balance and they have hours per frame to render these. Cards from Pixar introduced ray tracing just for reflections in shadows if I recall and not until Monsters University did we see all light sources being generated this way. I think we will see a small and slow adoption of engines incorporating ray trace functions within their engines but not replacing them as the large portion of hardware both on consoles and PC will not be able to support this which makes them by nature a limited solution for wider adoption. Just what next gen consoles from Sony and AMD and Microsoft have planned is yet to be shown but at least a similar method of an intelligent algorithm, hardware based functions within a hybrid approach would be my best guess. The day for a complete modern ray trace game is in real time at least is still some way off from reality but the latest step forward is the closest we have come to a solution that may just work in various causes and cases to achieve something remarkable. That date may not be visible just yet but the future is bright enough that it could slip into view very soon indeed. And as always, if you all enjoyed this, then please like, subscribe and share where appropriate. I am completely self-funded and independent and I do this as a part-time thing. If you want to read more on this or other content, you can check out my hosted work now that I've partnered with Rectify Gaming, who are hosting some of my written articles, including this one. But if you like my channel and content, please check out more on the YouTube channel itself. 
and if you can help support me and improve my quality of work by my patreon link which is also below you guys and girls take care play fast rasterize hard and i'll ray trace you in the future i'll see you on the next one